Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Optimo Pathfinder is the next generation of financial modeling. Designed specifically for Australian financial advisors, Pathfinder allows you to develop and compare multiple financial strategies within minutes. With cutting-edge optimization and built-in legislation, it removes the burden of time-consuming modeling and report creation. Easy to use and easy to understand. It saves hours of manual work and allows you to turn around financial strategies in a fraction of the time. Take your business to the next level with Optimo Pathfinder. Hello and welcome to this topic series on delivering advice differently. My name is Fraser Jack and in this episode number three of a five-part series, we tackle using visuals for engagement. Uh, from visual graphs and mud maps to realizing that this is part of something bigger in adult learning styles, uh, encouraging your clients to lean in and engage in the decision that you all make together. If you're thinking about how you can or why you should use visuals with your clients, then you'll get a lot out of this episode. Welcome back to this podcast series, Ben Martian. Thank you, Fraser. It it's good to be back again. Fantastic. Now we're talking about uh, the use of visuals and um, and really focusing in on how clients, as you know, as learners or as as adult students, or we want to call them as adults, learn or engage, uh, lean into conversations. Um, uh, and one of those things is obviously, you know, we we think through visuals and and being able to see and th- see and feel and do and all those sorts of parts of adult learning. Um, how important is this? Obviously, we've been bagging the paper SOAs a little bit in, in this particular um, series, but t- how important is visuals in the engagement process for consumers? Well, I think you're probably better with the specific terminology than I am, Fraser, in terms of adult learning styles. But when you think about the way, you know, as an individual, you generally do things in your life today. Uh, on social, I mean, let's talk about social media. If you're going through social media and you see a long written text post, you probably scroll past it too long, didn't read. Um, if there is a picture, you probably look at the picture. If there's a video, you'll stop and have a have a look at the video. You might watch the whole way through. You might not watch the whole way through. Uh, when you're going into work, you're probably listening to podcasts or audio books. The reality is most of us like to learn naturally and like to engage naturally with things other than written text. We don't like to sit there unless we're sitting down to read a, a good book. Uh, and even then, some of us have, have transitioned to audio books instead of, instead of actually reading the words. Um, we don't like to sit there and read long documents and, and long pieces of text to actually learn. Yeah, um, I just wanted to throw in there, Ben, that uh, when I'm learning something or when I'm uh, trying to learn, you know, go, I don't look at the instruction manuals anymore. I, how to use this camera or how to use this thing. I just go to YouTube and, and, and uh, put the, uh, the details in there and I watch, watch a few videos and go, Oh, that's great. It just teaches me straight away and uh, helps me, me personally learn better if I'm watching somebody else do it and then I can get in there and do it myself. Well, that's exactly right. And uh, I'm particularly fond of Lego. So I do follow the instruction manuals, but they're all pictures. And so the pictures tell me how to put together the Lego set. Um, But no, yeah, when I need to reset something in the car or when I need to learn how to um, build a shelf or even, you know, put together an Ikea, Ikea furniture or whatever, you just go to YouTube and you watch the videos on how to do it. And that's how we learn complex information these days we'll find somebody who we trust to to teach it to us via video yeah i think i think a big part of this for me is not just the engagement in it but once you do engage in it you can come away with a with a memory of that like a like from the consumer's point of view they come away with a memorable moment or a moment where they actually um engaged they then went um okay i understand that now and i can then recall that conversation or recall um what it might be and 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 you know 
go from there to be able to say, oh, yeah, no, I, 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 this is exactly how I did it or this is exactly how I, I'm going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that recall comes a lot more clearly when you can actually watch yourself back and experience. Uh, we all go through our phones and, and watch the videos of our kids doing things or ourselves doing things. We go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Or or our holidays, we go, oh, God, that was a good holiday. I miss out. We should do the holiday again. Um, because we we relive those experiences when we when we have a visual cue for them. Very few people write journals, very few people reread their journals because that's not the best way for us to recall information. Um, it is a way, but it's not the best way. Yeah, this is a really good point now. I was sort of going to focus more, more around the idea that um, when obviously in the financial advice process, there's a lot of um, complex information. There's, you know, there's, there's and, and graphs and mud maps and those sort of things are great ways of explaining in the first instant to the client um, during an advice process. And, and obviously when you're talking about doing a, an online meeting or recording it or recording the meetings, you really – leaning into that concept of showing versus um, telling and then you're, you're showing and allowing it to come back. Um, but you also mentioned there the relive the experience. That's also a visual, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we all sit there as planners and, and when we're having, when we're talking to a client, we might try explaining something, we get a blank blank stare back from them. And so we pull out a piece of paper or we jump up on the whiteboard or we pull out a presentation and we start going through the information. You you mentioned that there is a lot of information in financial advice. There's a lot of information in products. Most of it's not relevant to the client. Most of it isn't what they need to know to understand the recommendations and the strategies you're you're recommending. It it's taking that complex information and making it simple and understandable for the client. And so being able for a client to go, oh, I don't quite remember what Fraser said about salary sacrifice, but I understood it when he when he explained it to me. Being able to go back and watch that again will put you straight back in that moment, will give you that same information and will allow you to more easily and more quickly understand the, the concept of salary sacrifice, which is not a simple concept for a lot of consumers to understand. Um, and so, again, that's the benefit of, of recording meetings and then providing a copy of that back to the client. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, I think I think what you see there around the, you know, taking the complex to make it simple is really important. But I, as you were saying that, I was thinking of taking it, you know, to understandable is is the outcome that, you know, like creating something that is then understandable for the client to understand the information. Exactly, exactly right. And so not only can you get to the client, not only – in our advice meetings, do we get to the point where the client understands the beauty of recording it and then providing it back is you can actually ask the client to explain it in their own words so that they remember when they watch it back what the concept was or what the strategy was or what the what the particular product you were using was and the reasons why. And they're saying it in their own words and therefore when they go back and listen to it, it'll make sense to them. Reading it months or years down the track on a on a paper-based document just doesn't give you that same level of understanding and and put you back in that same headspace yeah and the and the other concept too to throw in this mix is you know visuals as a motivator um you know vis visuals can then motivate people to do things that especially around if they've got you know uh been able to create visuals around the goals and the goal setting part of financial planning yeah absolutely you think about anything in life if you've got a a picture of something in your mind that's much easier to aim for it or if you see a picture of yourself that's maybe not necessarily as flattering as what you might envisage yourself looking like you'll stop eating those donuts or you will go to the gym and do some exercise because that's what motivates you is 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 how you look and how you feel and and watching watching back that if you follow this financial plan, you will achieve these goals that you said were really, really important to you. You're more likely to, to remember. You're more likely to take action to achieve those outcomes and therefore you'll end up in a better financial position. Yeah. And when I think about, um, you know, visuals for past um, or visuals for, for the future, um, 
a lot of what we do is uh, we create words, right? We give we give our clients words, and then we we depend we rely on our client to translate those words into the visual we're expecting them to see, um, the visual of them at retirement, um, the visual of how much money they have. If we put it in words and we expect them to create it, they're going to create a visual based on their own past experience, which may look nothing like the visual that we're trying to actually let them know that's what it's going to look like. Well, as I said earlier, I think you're a little bit better with the terminology, but the way adults learn is that they will take in a variety of information, they'll reinterpret it themselves in their brain, and then they will create a picture of whatever the outcome is. Now, when I say picture, it could be a picture, or it could be an internal video, or it could be an internal diagram, or it could be words that they use, but their brain will process that information in a way that is is a way that their brain will understand whatever the concept is. Um, but they're creating that picture of the information in their own heads so that they understand it. And again, when we provide only written documentation of the advice we're providing, you're really limiting your client's ability to to re-understand or reconceptualize that that advice that concept or that strategy that you're providing them. Yep. And I think it makes a lot more sense to make a one step process uh, from an efficiency point of view to give them the actual visual, um, allow them to then see that and go, that's the visual we're going for, not to um, not to make them read the words and create their own. No. And to be honest, one of the things that planners could be thinking about is trying to understand their clients' learning preferences as they as they come into the advice process, um, because you can make life a lot easier for your clients if you if you know how they're going to understand information. Yeah, that's a really good point. And they may be uh, somebody who loves lots of words. And in that case, they can you can still give them lots of words. Ben, thanks so much for coming in and chatting to us today uh, around this particular subject. So we look forward to catching you in the next episode. It's been phenomenal to be here today with you, Fraser, and I look forward to the next episode. Welcome back and thank you for joining us, Prashant and Michelle. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks, Fraser. No problem. Now, we're talking about visuals and engagement and and throughout the client uh, process, obviously, humans don't always learn by reading reams of paper. They often, that's not the thing that they remember and what they take away. And the way that I think of, you know, visuals and engagement is what, you know, what are the things that clients are able, what are the memorable moments in an advice process that clients are able to tell other people about uh, and include other people in or, or, or just that cement in their own mind um, what's going on for their understanding point of view. Prashant, Let's start with you. Tell us about how you use visuals in your process. Obviously, it's we've mentioned this, that your process is predominantly an online process, uh, but how you use visuals uh, for engagement in your advice process? Sure. To us, I think visuals are very critical. And the reason being we are, as a service provider, as a professional service provider, we, you know, people make decisions based on the five senses, you know, what they see, what they can touch and what they can, you know, smell and hear and things. Unfortunately, we don't have anything in what we do, you know, and all, and the only thing we can probably get close to is see and hear, you know, and, and what we want to sort of, um, you know, do more of is to incorporate that tangibility elements with these two as much as possible. Um, so visuals uh, are one of the best ways we find that brings that tangibility um, and what that sort of converts to is when you sort of show them the tangible elements of this it then automatically results in clarity which i think is the best customer experience that i find that they find is that that moment where they realize, you know, that realization element. That's why the first month is the highest customer experience rating we get is that's that aha moment that's coming on. And uh, yeah, so clarity is probably that emotion. I think I'd rate the highest in the advisor, in the, the advisor client journey. Um, the more we're able to give that, the better it is for everyone. Yeah, that's really interesting, uh, Michelle. Yeah, I would absolutely second that. I think visuals are absolutely key. It's that taking the complexity and making it simple. And, you know, I love that aha moment um, that advisors tell us about all the time where their client for the first time feels like they've understood their financials. And it can be through a really simple graph, which, you know, might be a 20-year projection of this is your net wealth in 20 years if we implement this strategy. And when they compare it to where they are now or the before advice, I think that is just so powerful for them. 
a picture really speaks a thousand words and it doesn't have to be complex. It can be really simple graphics, but it's cutting through that gives understanding and it's exciting for clients. Yeah, it absolutely is. And when I think of, um, you know, I think of, you know, the compliance, what's, what is the value of advice? Everybody seems to think it's the, you know, the numbers putting you in a better position, but often as you, as you mentioned, Prashant, that clarity removes somebody from a current position of, let's say, uncertainty uh, and transforms them to that new position. And, and that from a value of an advice point of view, that could be worth more to them than the numbers. Absolutely. Yep. Now, when it comes to obviously providing that clarity, there is, you know, you're using tools and visuals and conversations, um, but you're also, this this becomes a two-way conversation, right? It's not just you presenting? That's correct. That's correct. I think um, communication is, um, you know, uh, essential and giving people time to, um, you know, um, be accessible. I guess, you know, what we normally do is once we sort of finish the first month and then over to the the next 12 months, we find that what clients need the most or what they value the most is not an answer. It's mostly the fact that you've listened to them and acknowledgement that you listen to them. And we found that the more we're available, we open that door, the, the, the happier they are. You know, they're not saying, I want an instant solution now, but they want that communication to be open that they want to feel like they can reach you um, or the whole team. So how we sort of communicate, keep this two-way thing open is we find ways, or we, we try to be in front of mind for them. Um, for example, uh, one of the key touch points we, we do is we we try to avoid death by emails as much as possible, uh, you know, um, um, and uh, we communicate through WhatsApp as a, as a, as a group. So let's say if there's three members of a team working on a, on a, on a member's sort of uh, uh, journey, um, all the four of us, the member, the three of us, everyone becomes part of a private group and we constantly communicate back and forth. And it's, it, this works much better when it's a couple even, because what we're finding is, um, you know, uh, one person in the relationship responds better in the mornings and one person responds better in the evenings. Everyone's got the different, you know, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, points. Um, but we're finding the engagement is much higher. And then when you're sort of keeping that communication, because people are already on that platform, you're not trying to create a platform and say, come over here. You're already there. And the more we are able to sort of, you know, if admin people have a question, they ask, pop, pop it there. If I know the answer, I'll, I'll answer straight away. You know, it's not like the admin team has to come back to me. So it's that platform where we're actually visually showing the members, we are working on your stuff. We're not trying to hide behind the scene. You know, it's almost like, you know, you see, you see these days, even you sort of, um, uh, restaurants are probably a great example. 10 years ago, your, your kitchen was somewhere hidden in the back. No one knows what the hell was going on in there. Today, you're finding the kitchen coming somewhere in the center. It's opened up, you know, all these new restaurants because people like to, you know, people value what they see. They see, you know, when you're right, you know, people like to be a part of the process. So we're trying not to hide away from that. So this minimizes error. Customer, our members value why something's taking a little longer. They see what's behind the scene and the communication is really, really, you know, strong. So that's how we manage communication behind the scene. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. And then obviously opening it up, I love the analogy around the kitchen. Um, t- tell us about, tell us a bit more about these WhatsApp groups. Like how, how do you work out what they're going to be about? There's obviously you in a group with the client, but are you, do you have groups with more clients in it that clients can talk to other clients? No, not at this point. Not at this point. It's very private, just between um our team and the, and the client, just because it, it needs to be that safe place and, you know, uh, and things. We don't have the capacity to have a builder community just yet uh, in terms of moderation and things like that, but we would love to get there, but it's not uh, an immediate priority for now. And how are you finding response times? Obviously, it's, it's very easy to have something if you've got a quick question or, or information or want to send something to the client to be able to send them to something that's already on their phone. Yes, we're finding that response time is off the charts. When I say off the charts, if we want something from them, we get it within an hour, tops. Like, you know, maybe maybe at the end of the day, if someone's super busy, but 
it's very hard for us to see it go through the next day. Um, even when it's, especially if it's quick questions, hey, can you can you tell us what your savings balance is? If it was that sort of a question, we get that within like five minutes most often, you know, because these are things that, you know, that they are constantly watching or looking. And, um, you know, uh, I, I reckon a lot of people spend a lot of time on these platforms already. So just being there front of mind, is, is making the response time faster. And Prashant, I imagine that's something that really helps you build rapport um, with your clients in a remote setting because, you know, you're, you're getting much faster interactions with them. That's right. That's right. It, it, it actually helps us in a lot of ways, you know. It helps a couple of ways. One, compliance. We have a log of everything that's happened between us and the customer. You know what I mean? So there's there's a file notes ready there. You know, we just need to copy it and paste it on our thing. You know, and the and the clients are able to ask questions. Sometimes they don't. Some people don't even type. They actually record it. You know, there's a button in your WhatsApp thing that records. So if someone's just speaking, wanting to speak their mind, they just put it in there and go, "Hey, I was thinking about this. What do you think?" You know, it's it's just um, it's amazing. So it 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 gets them to tell what they're feeling. It allows us to manage our process on a compliant point of view. Then it helps us operationally as well that like our admin team is not waiting for anyone. Our, our clients are not waiting for an answer. If Prashant is not available to respond, if our admin team knows the answer to the question, they jump in and answer, you know? If they say, what was my, you know, savings target again, you know, for this this month? If admin team knows this, they'll you know they'll let them know this is what we are working on. You know, so it's it's great like that. I love this initiative. Now, to, now with regards to what WhatsApp, why why did you choose that particular platform when there's probably other messaging platforms around? We are feedback. We found that most people use that. You know, so we're not trying to create something. Most people were on it already. They're highly engaged on that. We're not trying to, you know, it's that old wine in a new bottle thing. We're not trying to change or introduce them to something that they would feel hostile or resistive towards. We don't want to introduce too many things too quickly. So it's more about that familiarity, simply that. Um, yeah. It's also about meeting customers where they're at. 100%. Fantastic. Now, um, Michelle, I want to ask you a little bit around um, the concept of visuals, especially around with graphs assumptions. Every time, every time we think of a graph, and this comes back down to you know being able to explain to the, the clients what what the inputs are, what the assumptions are, and those sorts of things, because a lot of people will sort of have that inkling behind. You know, I can see the answer, but how did we get to that? What are your thoughts on assumptions? Yeah, it's assumptions really important that they're transparent and upfront, and it's also the thing that balances the simplicity and clarity you can get with the graphs. I mean, when you've got a really simple graph, that's great and you get cut through, but you've also got to explain and make it clear these are all the assumptions that went into that. It's the underpinning of that simplicity. And if you can make that clear and lay that out, and it's also things that you can edit and change, that's super important. Yep, Prashant. Yeah, I, I think assumption, it's, you know, modeling, I find is, you know, it's like that. Um, it's like a sausage machine. What the quality of what goes in, you know, uh, spits out the quality of what comes out kind of thing, you know. So, and we, we do spend a lot of time educating the clients on the assumption that goes into this, you know, so they understand this is not like a kind of like a, um, you know, the journey is not going to be as smooth as the charts look. It's going to be slightly different. And it also, it, it, it's one of those things. This is sort of, it, it helps us to say, these are the assumptions. This tells you how the route's going to be. It's not going to tell you what the bumps are going to look like. You know, that's going to be slightly different. But it just the fact that you're able to sort of go through the assumptions with them and allow them to change it even. If they want to say, hey, that's too little or that's too more, you know, conservative, just us having the ability to change it in front of them also gives that you know opportunity for that co-creation thing. Yeah, and I think it's really important that they're both transparent and also editable. Um, you know, so a classic one is interest rates, you know, for really easily to be able to stress test interest rates and say, right, you know, it might be 3% now, but what if they go up to 5% in five years time or whatever your assumptions are to be able to model that easily in front of a client and adjust those assumptions. Yes, stress testing is certainly a big part of, um, you know, helping your client with their internal behaviours and to be able to say, you know, what, what are the potential risks? Uh, Prashant, do you, is that what you do with your clients, you, you stress test? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Interest rate something that we stress test consciously. Um, um, we sort of uh, 
um, you know, things like assumed growth on their properties, you know, for, you know, you people usually tend to overestimate what their house is worth or what their stuff is worth, you know, uh, so, so trying to sort of go through that with them and come up with a number, you know, it's again, it's not my number, it's your number based on what your view of the world is. Of course, we are here to correct it with them if they're miles off it, you know, but it's not, you know, just being agnostic as much as possible, but having that baseline to sort of, you know, say, um, you know, this is what we're working on. Um, um, I think they'd really enjoy those assumptions. It actually adds a lot of financial literacy elements in those conversations too. You know, some clients don't even, they know what inflation is. They don't know how it affects them to an extent. You know, they, um, and have, just going through some of these assumptions and the more conservative you're able to show it, the more happier they become uh, is, is just that, okay, even about this assumption, I'm worth, you know, I'm there. That's awesome, you know. But it's also really important in the review process if you can come back, you know, 12 months later, why didn't we hit this particular goal? And you can go, well, you know, inflation or interest rates or this particular assumption that we modelled to be this amount, mm. completely different because of market forces or something else that's going on. Yeah, exactly right. That's and right. then you can then you can pinpoint the reasons why and whether, it, uh, whether it's up or down. Now, Michelle, I wanted to ask you about um, – the concept of storytelling in in and around uh, this sort of process with you, by using visuals um, to, to create this engagement. To me, a lot of this is around uh, estimating what makes a good conversation because I obviously do a lot of content, so I like to I lean into this type of thing, um, understanding what the pain points might be, understanding what the solution might be, understanding what the benefits might be to the client, and be able to use the the framework of storytelling uh, along with the visuals in a presentation. Yeah, I think the visuals really lend themselves to that storytelling element because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's about what clients take away from that from that experience and w- what is it that they understand. If from the clarity that you're giving them, they can see that, well, it means that I get to retire five years earlier than I otherwise, you know, thought and I can still do the renovation on the house and whatever that happens to be. But it's how do you translate all that sort of complexity into something simple they can understand and then what do they take away and tell their friends? Do you, do you think about that, Prashant, with your process? Yes, the storytelling element, um, yeah. Fraser. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, uh, uh, you know, that's, I guess, the most powerful thing um, in this in this exercise, you know, with, with your clients is where, you know, where you've come from and where you're going to go and, and just, you know, uh, um, you know, showing them the point of convergence and then the divergence, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's very important. And again, if you don't do it right, you're not going to get the behaviors and the outcomes on the, on what you just blueprinted, you know? Yeah. To me is, to me is about looking at the current situation and projecting it forward and saying, this is where mm. if you do nothing, you're going to, going to be um, yes. versus if you do something. That's correct, yeah. The other thing I found really powerful in the storytelling piece is actually how advisors use the visuals and the storytelling to demonstrate the value of their advice. So an example of that is quite a lot of advisors will first model a case where it's that if you do nothing, this is where you would end up in 20 years time as a net wealth projection. And then when you start to model some of the scenarios that clients are interested in, and you can then quantify the value of that advice, and advisors will often sort of build in their fees into that process. So, you know, when you can see that you're going to be this much better off in 20 years time based on the advice that you've taken and fees are built in, you can demonstrate that you're leaving the client in a better financial position and that they're better off. And, you know, when they can see the difference from where they are now to where they'd be in the future with the advice, it's that's been really a really important um, storytelling piece for advisors to justify the value of their advice. Great point there, Michelle, uh, because, you know, we, uh, we find that, you know, when we try to do that, do nothing kind of a scenario for example don't do anything and here's three other ways to get something it's really emphasizing that not taking an action actually cost you heaps mm. more than taking an action 
you know it actually puts you know it's you know it it actually shows them that this is you're going backward by doing nothing you know and quite often when you don't you know there's that paradox of choice most cust- most most individuals they you know when you give them too many things to think about they they choose not to do anything you know because it's not you know it's not pressurizing you know it's not actually the pain point's not that big enough for them to do any change but when you show this it gets that buy in into the behavioral changes that we want it then converts to that interaction and the highly engaged communication and back and forth you know that all of a sudden that one person you know we we realize that there's always going to be one person in the driver seat in the financial decisions in a relationship more often than not just a tight everyone makes the decision together but one person is usually in the driver seat more often than not and you're finding when you sort of show these things both people both of them try to get under the driver seat in in their own ways you know it's 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 a brings them together um so yeah i find i find that uh, uh um amazing i think uh, i think you're you spot on there when you when you use the words driver's seat and what does their internal drive to you know as you mentioned before you know create behavioral change in their current actions and uh, and I, I like the way that you presented that then too and then there's the cost of not taking action um, so some people could show a graph and say this is the benefit of taking action and other people could look at that same graph and go this is the cost of not taking action because the reality is a lot of this you know financial advice stuff is really scary for a lot of people it takes a lot of courage for people to step out and get financial advice and then trust that advice and act on it Prashant, did you want to add anything to that? Well, it's just, I'm not sure if it's relevant, but to us, uh, for Daniel and I, we always laugh about this. It's it's like, we say, if we can actually make our wives understand what we do, we've done a bloody good job, <laughs> you know? So because to, in our household, Selva, my wife, is she usually lets me be on the driver's seat. And I actually we actually did a financial modeling for our own household. And her level of engagement to see where this is going just, you know, changed completely. Um, so, yeah, I, I was just sort of thinking of that and putting ourselves into that shoe too, yeah. So what was the what was the engagement point for her? Where did it get her interest? Um, for her, it was it was around how it, it was around that choices that she has in into the future. It was just knowing that she has choices. Uh, that was the the part that was. Um, you know, um, that opened her mind that there's a couple of ways I could do this and there's not many, it's hard to fail kind of thing. Or otherwise, she was like, you know, she was just doing her thing, working, and she's like, okay, Prashant manages everything. He'll sort it out kind of uh, a behavior. But now she knows, you know, this is why we're doing this. When I say we have the share portfolio and this is what's happening there, she now understands which part of the puzzle that's fitting in. Um, and then it's also saying the impact of those choices. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, you know, and uh, she's already sort of said, okay, in 15 years, I want to go live with my parents in India, you know, because she's like, she knows there's a passive income stream building up and she's already talking to her family about it, you know, little things like that. And it's, uh, it's amazing how that visuals just changed her. And that's when I was telling Daniel, mate, if this is how this is going to work, it's going to be awesome for our clients. This was going back two years ago. That's a really interesting test to, uh, to overlay into your business, <laughs> isn't it? Because you're probably in, a, in, the, in the same uh, situation as most of the advisors listening to this podcast, where they're probably the lead uh, CFO in, in their relationship, and, and and to be able to bring or engage their partners into the process, it's a it's a it's a great measuring stick. I love it, uh, Prashant Michelle. Thank you so much for being part of this particular episode, where we talked a lot about the uh, the visuals or, or engaging part of the advice process. Uh, we look forward to catching you in episode four of our five part series when we start talking about uh, understanding and empowerment. Thank you for joining us again, Jeff. Oh, pleasure. Nice to be here, Fraser. Fantastic. Now, we're talking about uh, the idea of visualising things and clients uh, grasping on to the concept of when they see visuals, they sort of lean in and become more engaged. Uh, tell us a little bit about your process and how you use visuals with your clients. Yeah, I, I'm, I use them the whole, the whole process. Uh, I'm, I Actually, it's, it's sort of happened by default. I do have quite a few clients in... Uh, in remote country areas and so I had to really embrace uh, virtual technology quite early on when I was building this business so I was sort of catapulted into that environment and then COVID uh, two years ago now has meant I just had to flick that switch and really uh, pursue that so most most of my meetings are using uh, virtual technology 
And so when you're using virtual technology, you really have to be on top of your game and you can't just sit there and chat. So I use visual tools at every single step of the process and and I actually really enjoy it. Um, it because the client it is you are talking it's no chit chat you you can get straight into it and and I've sort of used software but I also use um, PowerPoint now so well I, it's not nothing new but <laughs> it is really quite powerful to use it and I sort of overlay the uh, some key charts diagrams with the PowerPoint presentation and then I can step through that quite efficiently put in key. Uh, key quotes, key performance graphs, uh, goals, objectives. So it's all very, I feel it's quite <laughs> slick, but it has taken a while to get there. So it's a, so every meeting I have has a meeting plan and has outcomes that I'm going to achieve. And that's all the way from initial introductory meeting through to presentation of their financial advice. So that, as I mentioned before, that could be up to five meetings. So even the estate planning is also very visual. Yeah, so it, it, well, I imagine some of that's a lot of mud maps and you know just presenting how things work in in, in a visual drawing. Ah, uh, no, I use technology. Uh, I know I don't. Um, uh, I've got to be efficient. I can't sit there and draw squiggly diagrams and expect the client to be fascinated by my handwriting. So no. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I, I also like what you said then about uh, every single meeting has an objective, you know, has an outcome and, and, and you know, I'm managing that means an agenda um, to some degree uh, that you then present to the, the client at the beginning. So this is what we want to get to by the end. Is that, is that how you, you start your presentations? It is. Yeah. So I, I, I traditionally send that meeting plan to them before the meeting and also with some uh, homework they might need to do. Um, I don't, I'm not a big one for sitting in front of them and filling out a fact find. So it's all, all done uh, electronically. So they have homework to do. Um, they might watch a video as well before the meeting. And then when we have the meeting, it's, it continues on that same theme. Yep. Now, does that mean uh, you're able to, I'm just going to quickly take an assumption here that you're able to either get more done in the meeting because you're straight into it or you're, uh, or you're able to have sh slightly shorter meetings? Slightly shorter. Yeah. I'm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, obviously uh, I don't have to worry about setting up my office and mucking around with presentation within the office. So it's just a Zoom background and away we go. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Now, uh, now, how do you find those visuals? Like, I mean, um, the assumption is that um, uh, adults learn better when they can see and feel and hear and do and all sorts of things, not just read. Um, how do you find those visuals in the presentations when, especially maybe when you're working with a couple or, you know, more, more than one person in the meeting and, and you're, uh, you know, are they leaning in and being more engaged in those visual moments? Yeah, a good, good example, I've got, you know, I have a whole, you know, range of different clients and and some can be very humble to the most sophisticated uh, high net worth. So just last week I had, had a client who, you know, they're all, <clears throat> he, his really goals are quite humble, but in comparison to some other ones. But, you know, when I showed him the graph, which showed him achieving what he really wants, uh, he, he's quite locked in and and I think that is why he's still a client is because he can see what the outcomes will be for him in a visual sense uh, which is only a couple of years away for him now so that I think it's extremely powerful and this doesn't necessarily have to be in the statement of advice <laughs> so it's a visual outcome that he can picture yes we always do talk about the difference between a statement of advice and the actual uh, visual plan that people can can uh, tangibly see and and um, you know tell their friends about um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you about was the the idea in each of your meetings you mentioned you had a, a clear meeting outcomes but do you um, do a bit of uh, engage a bit of storytelling technique in each of those presentations as well well <clears throat> part of my philosophy is I'm helping the clients narrate their story it's um, I didn't realize you knew that Fraser but yeah <laughs> no, that is part of my philosophy is I'm helping them write the chapters of their story. So it is about story and where they've come from, where they're at now and what they want to do. So I do actually mention yep. that in my presentations. 
Yeah, exactly right. And so the with the, with in regards to the concept of storytelling, the the your client becomes the hero of their own journey, their own story, and you you're there as the the oracle or the uh, the guide. That's my job. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, I love it. No, yeah. that, and and it is about their story. So they're all so different, and it's actually why I enjoy doing this is I get to find out different people's stories, and they're all quite fascinating. Yep, it's definitely a rewarding part mm. of the job, isn't it? Yeah, getting to be, getting to be part of their uh, their story, especially when I the just, outcomes. And if I just might mention that the estate planning is about a key part of that story is passing on the family story. You can't yes. really do the rest without that part. Keeping the story going, fantastic, uh, Jeff. So thank you so much for being uh, involved in this particular episode. We we'll look forward to chatting to you again when we get into episode four. Thank you, Fraser. My pleasure. 